our fifth annual Darwin Day and Second Humanist Society of New York anniversary dinner or luncheon or brunch, this is uh, sort of in the middle. And uh, um, this is, by the way, our 25th anniversary. Uh, we, uh, uh, the organization was formed in January of 1988. I don't think anybody here was around then. I don't think so. So, we have some, uh, we're all together. Maybe a few more people will come in, but I think we can start to eat. After which, our distinguished speaker, uh, Philip Kitcher, John Dewey Another Professor red. of Philosophy at Columbia University, will talk to us about ethics after Darwin or since Darwin. And we'll all drink a toast to Charlie. And um, on your plate, you will see a reproduction of uh, uh, an altered reproduction of page 11 of the current of the January newsletter uh, for our annual Dump Award. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. As the instructions say, simply circle the paragraph or the picture of the idiot you think deserves the uh, silver horse's ass trophy. Uh, Matter of fact, I think we ought to invest in a two foot high one. But at any rate, uh, see who gets the we, we have, of course, had a number of votes online, but those of you who have uh, come here today, um, you get the chance to vote a second time, if, even if you've already voted. So, like that. So let's just, let's just do lunch first, okay? The Silver Horses Ass Award goes to Representative Todd Aiken, who we will probably never hear of again anyway. Are you going to mail it to him? No. He has to come and get it. <laughs> I want to add some to the treasure because I'm the treasure and I want you to know that I will as well. We, this is a very economical award. We have never had to replace it because it was never <laughs> So we never had to buy a second one. <laughs> okay. I want to welcome two people who I hope we will see again. Uh, the uh, the Fura of <laughs> of uh, uh, CFI New York City uh, and uh, Janet Asimov a long-time member and a very distinguished one. I'm glad, very glad that you're here today. Uh, Philip Kitcher is a distinguished teacher, philosopher, author, John Dewey, professor of philosophy at Columbia University, and our very distinguished guest, Dr. Kitcher, on uh, Darwin and ethics since Darwin. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's a great pleasure to come and celebrate Darwin's birthday a little bit late um, with all of you. Um, when I was thinking about this, I recalled an old um, Peanuts cartoon I saw many years ago. Um, in it, one of the characters, one of the kids, is writing about uh, ancient Greece and uh, uh, he's writing, a, you know, sitting there writing his essay, and uh, he says, ancient Greece is a long time before our time. They didn't have any televisions, but they had lots of philosophers. <laughs> I personally would not like to spend all evening watching a philosopher. Um, and I, that sort of gets something right, I think. Um, so uh, I'll try not to speak too long. Uh, what I want to talk about today is something I've written about, which is how you should think about ethics if you don't think of ethics as embodying or embedded in some sort of religious framework. As you all know, and I suspect you've all had friends who've, uh, who've looked at you and said, uh, you're a secular humanist. Um, can I really trust you anymore? Uh, the, the thought is that people who don't have a religious belief can't be serious about their ethical responsibilities, their ethical claims. Now, I mean, the very peaceableness of this banquet, right, shows that that's not right. I mean, mayhem hasn't broken out in this room yet today, and I, I suspect it's not going to. 
Um, I could try to provoke it, but perhaps that would be unwise. Um, in any event, it seems very clear that you can have be very, very serious in your ethical views and yet not be a religious person. And that poses a problem. So what is ethics all about if it's not about the will of the Almighty? Well, I want to begin by saying something which um, has been known to philosophers for over 2,000 years, which is that it was known to Plato. Uh, Plato saw very, very clearly that actually trying to base ethical truths on the will of the divine being was a thoroughly bad idea. His argument is very simple. If the divine being is really the basis of ethics, if what makes honesty right and violence wrong is that some being wills that, then ethics is founded arbitrarily. What that being, powerful, big, though he or she may be, says goes. And that means that the arbitrary will of a, you know, a supposedly existent being is what lies at the foundation of ethics. And that's a terrible thought. That's not what people mean when they think that ethical claims have some uh, purchase on us and on our actions. Uh, philosophers have said throughout history, if you're going to obey the Almighty, then you better be pretty clear that the Almighty isn't just powerful, but also good. And that means that there has to be some source of goodness independent of the God and his will. Okay, so it's a very bad idea to ground ethics in religion because in effect what you're doing is very much what the sort of thing that was done by people who after the atrocities of the uh, 20th century said things like, well, I was only following orders. To follow orders, you have to have some confidence that the being who's giving the orders is good. And that means you have to have some access to a notion of goodness that's prior to the issuing of the orders themselves. Religious people don't seem to me really ever to have come to terms with this very important point. But, in any event, the whole issue is moot because there isn't any such being to issue orders. So let's now concentrate on how we might think about the correctness of the ethical ideas that we have. Are we compelled to think that when we say things like honesty is a good thing, violence is a bad thing, we're just expressing arbitrary social conventions? I don't think so. Darwin didn't think so. And in celebrating Darwin, we can re remember the fact that after writing The Origin of Species, he wrote another book, The Descent of Man, in which he tried to hold out the possibility of a theory of morality that would be founded in our human nature. And that's what I want to talk about today. Because I think there is actually a very deep foundation for morality, for ethics. And it doesn't come from up there, it comes from us. And not from us as individuals, but from all of us together. So let me try to explain that, what I have in mind. So let's ask a very simple question. Here we all are, beings who are capable of modifying our conduct, of learning that certain things that we thought of as being okay are really not okay, and then from that point on, modifying our behavior so that we don't do them anymore. I mean, you've all probably witnessed uh, important changes in ethical ideas in your lifetime. I mean, I know I have. I mean, when I was growing up, it was perfectly okay to condemn people who loved those of, their same, of the same sex, to mock them, to torment them, to bully them. Most people don't think that's okay anymore. I mean, there may be differences about whether you think they should marry, be allowed to marry one another. Uh, 
I personally am a very firm believer in extending those rights completely across the board. Uh, but we've come, independently of that, we've come a long way in treating people who love people of their own sex. That seems to me like progress. And it's part of the ongoing process of ethical revision. And we can hope that that sort of progress will be more widespread and that it can continue. So where does this idea of ethical progress come from? How can we make sense of it? So let's think about it. We weren't always able to do this sort of thing. We weren't always animals who could modify our conduct in response to standards that we set for ourselves. Our remote ancestors weren't able to do that. Our evolutionary cousins, the chimpanzees and bonobos, can't do that. So how did we come to be able to do it? Well, along the way, we've obviously acquired certain kinds of capacities. We can stand back and think about our own behavior. And in response to our thinking about our own behavior and discussing it with one another, we can then set ourselves new standards. We can do things differently. And if you look at the people in the world who live closest to the ways in which our um, Paleolithic ancestors live, people like the hunter-gatherer societies, they sit down and they talk with one another a lot about the ways in which they should work together and the ways in which they should be together. That seems to me a huge breakthrough, a huge and important breakthrough. And I want to suggest that that's actually where ethics comes from. Ethics comes out of two things. We have the biological makeup to get along with one another to a certain degree, to live together in groups. Lots of organisms can't do that, or at least not in the ways that chimpanzees, bonobos, and our ancestors could do it. But we don't have the biological capacities for doing it easily. We can relate to one another, but not very well. And if you look at the societies of chimpanzees and bonobos, they waste an incredible amount of time because they're constantly getting in one another's way and not cooperating, and then they have to sit down together and make up, and that's what all that plucking at the fur is all about. You can get the parasites out of the fur, um, primatologists reckon, in about 20 minutes, but they do it for at least three hours a day on average, and when things are really tense, for about six hours a day. What's it all about? Well, you've got societies that are constantly on the verge of falling apart, and they need peacemaking to get along. We've replaced that. This event today is something that is absolutely impossible for chimpanzees and bonobos and uh, our, our remote ancestors who were like them. You couldn't bring 50 people or more together in a room unless they all had lived and worked with one another day after day after day after day. So what's enabled us to do it? The answer to that is a form of ethical life. An ethical life, working out shared rules for our living together, is an important part of what made us human. That's the hypothesis. Rules are worked out in groups on terms of relative equality, and most of human history has been dominated by groups of people no larger than the group that's currently in this room. Although I would have to say they, they would be a lot younger. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, there are very, very, very few uh, people representative of the ages of those ancestral human groups. And they worked it out. They had to work it out. Otherwise, they would have been stuck in the evolutionary dead end of the chimps and the bonobos. And that's what enabled people to do all sorts of things, to start to cooperate with the group across the river, to invent trade, eventually to come together in cities of a 1,000 or so. That's about 8,000 years ago and eventually to form extremely complex societies like the ones in which we live today. You need those shared rules, and they need to be worked out. 
the root problem is that we're responsive to one another, that makes us want to live together, and we're not responsive to one another enough to do it really well without these rules. Now, along the way, some curious things happen. One of the curious things that happened is that people had to come up with a solution to the problem of how you monitor the conduct that individuals go in for when they're out of the sight of their fellows. So, you know, the, the group disperses during the day. People go wandering off. How do you know that people are going to play by the agreed on rules when they're no longer visible to their fellows? A brilliant idea. Either the origin of religion or a great adaptation of religion. There's always somebody watching you. And this individual who is watching you is incredibly powerful. And he will do very nasty things to you if you should break the rules. It's a brilliantly successful idea, but it actually perverts the growth of the ethical life. And it does so because it perverts the shared working out of ethical <coughs> rules together. So I want you to imagine our remote ancestors starting to live an ethical life, trying to figure out with one another how they should interact and how they should uh, work together. And then someday, some bright member of the group proposes, well, you know, there's this being possibly the being who's responsible for the thunder and all the other inexplicable things that go on. And this being is always watching. And if we break the rules, that being will get very, very annoyed with us. Brilliant. From that point on, the group's conformity to the agreed on rules goes up. That's a, that's a step forward. But now there's also a step back. Because someday, some other bright individual comes along and says, you know what? I go into these funny trances from time to time, and I have access to the will of the great father who is watching us. And I know what that being really wants. And then you get all these things that get written down, eventually get written down, or passed on in oral tradition. The individual rules that tell you what these privileged people think the being wants. They reflect their own prejudices. And that's what basically what we've inherited. We've inherited something which is a, a, an important functional system for getting along with one another, which has been distorted in various ways because individuals have claimed to have absolute authority in this matter. So what I want to suggest to you is a different picture of ethics. What makes for ethical progress is our solving the problems that come up in our joint living with one another. The problems that arise from the fact that we can relate to one another, but we sometimes neglect the interests of those around us. That problem is principally overcome when we can negotiate, when we can sit down and everybody's voice can be heard and we can work out solutions that all can agree on. But that gets distorted when it's thought that there is this really deep source of ethical life that's outside us, independent of all of us, and that some people have access to it and others don't. The idea of a final authority in ethics is a very bad idea. Because ethical life is primarily something that we do together. We're all in it together. And how long have I spoken for? About 20 minutes? Don't, don't stop. Don't stop. Okay. Don't stop. Okay. Uh, but, I'm not gonna, but I don't want to go on too much longer. And that brings me to, to how I see our ethical obligations today. And those are, I think, to renew this project that our ancestors began so long ago. They were in groups of 50 to 70, relatively small, and gradually expanded to extend protections to individuals who were in the neighborhood, who had been treated with hostility beforehand, 
And that gave rise to the possibility of some sort of friendly relations, at least from time to time among different bands. And that eventually allowed for larger and larger settlements. All of that is highly progressive, but it's overlaid with the emergence of all sorts of inequalities, starting out with that fundamental inequality that says that some people know what the ethical life is really all about and how to do it right, and others don't. I want to suggest that for us, the problem remains. We live in a world in which we are no longer affected by what the people just around us with whom we can talk on a daily basis do but by lots and lots and lots and lots of things that go on in very different distant places. Our species is now interconnected in ways that it's never been before. And things that you do and things that I do will affect the well-being and the lives of people in very distant places. And for me, if we think seriously about the origins of our ethical life and the problems that it was designed to cope with, the problems of non-responsiveness to others, what emerges for us today is the obligation to see that through without all the, all the silliness and the artificial prejudices that have come up from embedding ethics within religion or associating ethics with the authority of particular people. It's a collective enterprise, it's a joint enterprise, we're all in it together. And that means not just people in this room, or people in Manhattan, or people in the United States, or even all the people who happen to live now, but all of us and all of those who will come after us, all of our descendants. And the challenge for us is to think about all of these individuals as potential claimants people to whom we should, in, certain, in, in, in a very straightforward sense, equally respond. So what I'm suggesting is that thinking about ethics in this way makes ethics fully humanist and fully cosmopolitan. Our responsibilities are extremely wide. This comes up as soon as we start to think about those arenas in which our entire species is involved in affecting life that will happen after us. As, for example, with the problems of our shared environment and, in particular, of the climate. This is one paradigmatic problem that shows how important it is for all of us to respond to each. And this may require some quite radical rethinking about the social and economic and political arrangements on our planet. And what I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that this will be easy or proposing political solutions. I'm just saying that the, that the deepest phenomenon in ethics is a problem that started this project, that made the kinds of societies we have today possible, that made the world we have today possible, and we have to come to terms with that because that problem's still with us. So if we're going to make further progress, it's going to be made not simply by recognizing people who haven't been recognized before, like people who had to suppress or keep private the fact that they loved members of their own sex. It's a wonderful moment when that taboo got lifted. It was an artificial, arbitrary taboo but we've got to come to terms with the claims of all people. And that will involve, I think, working towards a new kind of politics and a new kind of way of thinking about society and our economic relations. And now I think I will stop there and just suggest that if you take Darwin seriously, we're animals. But we should always remember, as my, my old friend Stephen Jay Gould said, not only that we evolved from apes, but also that we evolved from apes. And an important part of that evolution from is our being able to understand the claims of one another, to understand the limits of our own altruism towards one another, 
and to do something about it. And the greatest thing perhaps our species has ever done is invent the ethical life. It's not invented arbitrarily, it's founded in deep difficulties that are part of the human predicament. And it, it's been overladen in history with all sorts of distortions and excrescences, many of them introduced by the embedding of ethics within religion. And the time has now come, I think, to go beyond that and develop that project as it was in the beginning and keep going and really take humanism very seriously indeed. Anyway, thank you very much. Few questions. Yeah. Uh, you, you have anything to say about the militarism of ethics? Are there cultural differences? Is there a more ethical kind of common to all the humanities? Terrific. I do think that there are, in fact, certain kinds of core ethical generalizations. Your mother probably told you some of them. Um, in general, the default assumption is that when people ask you things, you should tell them the truth. In general, the default assumption is that you shouldn't initiate violence. These are, it seems to me, core ethical commitments, and they come from the fact that, that taking those as the default position is a way of responding, typically a way of responding to other people. So let me take the honesty case, because this, this is a, it's an easy one. So, if I say to you, always tell the truth, that's generally good advice. There are cases in which it breaks down. When somebody who is, is asking, who is asking you a question has evil intent, they want to know information so they can go and do something awful to a bunch of other people. Classic philosophical example, you have some refugees hidden in your attic and the Gestapo turns up at the door and says, do you have any refugees hidden in, in the attic? Um, your obligation under those circumstances is not to tell the truth. Why? Because there are different parties whose interests are to be considered. If you were to respond to the Gestapo officer by you know, taking his interests seriously, you would be failing to respond to the very deep interests of the people who have been persecuted, who have been taken away. So there are such things as altruistic lies. Altruistic lies can occur sometimes in medical contexts, I think, when people need to be sheltered from particular kinds of information. But the default assumption is be honest. And that's because being honest is typically a way of being responsive to other people. And I would say the same for the initiation of violence. So there are, I think, ethical universals, universe statements that, that all cultures will happen onto, that will solve part of this problem, and will always be part of solutions to this deep problem that gives rise to ethical life. But I also think that cultures can diverge on other things. So I think in terms of a core that is common, and certain other issues that really, really can be left open. So. Um, you know, we could talk about those sorts of things, but I, I, do, I do want to suggest, to stress this idea of a common core. I feel I'm a pluralist, but not a relativist, because I think in terms of this core of absolutes. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go this way and then that way. All right. Are there such things as whites that have status under the way? Okay, that's terrific. Ter another terrific question. Um, yeah, but the rights are, are created by us. I mean, we, we are the sources of rights. I don't think there are rights antecedent to our decisions about what those rights are. So rights are founded in the fact that certain kinds of collective decisions solve this fundamental problem of responsiveness. That's what I'd say about rights. And uh, I don't want, I don't, I don't like these ideas that some philosophers uh, uh, gravitate towards of distancing um, rights and making, and trying to find a ground for them that's independent of us and what we do. I mean, I'm thinking that not everybody uh, credits 
these rights, like the, like the Gestapo right. doesn't uh, right. credit the right of the people in the uh, attic to, uh, to live. That's right. Yeah, but that, I mean, but what they're doing is objectively and absolutely wrong. And its wrongness regard, is, is, resides in the fact that they are violating a prescription which is part of the solution to the problem of limited human responsiveness. So what I want to say, I mean, let me, let me spell this out for you so you'll see the logic of my position. Um, there is this fundamental problem out of which ethics grows. If something is a solution to that problem that is as it were, indefinitely part of the solution to that problem, then that something counts as an enduring ethical truth. And these enduring ethical truths are the, the embodiment of rights. And if people, if particular people, do things that violate those truths, then what they are doing is objectively, ethically wrong. Okay, so I want to, I mean, there are two questions. One, one, one question is a philosophical question of what sense you can make of ethical truth, and I've tried to, I've tried to tell you the answer to that question. The second question is what, what you do to get people who don't recognize those truths or, or act in ways that violate those, um, those truths to behave better. And that's, of course, a practical question, and it's, it's the sort of question that that social thinkers and politicians wrestle and lawyers wrestle with all the time. But my task is to give an account of the, of the truth of the core ethical claims, not, not, not devise strategies that will make the Gestapo as it were vanish, or their equivalents vanish. I'd like to be able to do that, but that's, that's a task that comes into play once you've seen what the ethical truths are. Okay. Does that answer your question? Unhappily, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Lorraine. Um, so you mentioned that the, the start of religion came from, <coughs> in part, uh, having someone watching over people so when they were out on their own, they would behave according to what the group, the group principles. That's not quite what I said, but go on with your question. <laughs> okay, well, th my question is, if we don't believe that the, the person in the sky or wherever, the God, then in this society today, what, what is re a replacement for that, so to speak? Yeah. So look, the first thing I want to say is I don't actually know where the God how hypothesis originated, but it could be that, that gods were introduced as some people think as explanatory devices for all sorts of things that, that, that groups don't understand. I, 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 point, I gesture sure. towards the thunder. Yeah. Yeah. But one very striking feature about the world's religions is, that, is the prevalence of this idea of you're being watched right, and right. You're, you're going to be punished if you do something that, right. that doesn't obey with the rules, right? It's a very powerful idea. Now, if you take away the idea of the watcher, then you have to have substitutes for that. Now, I actually think that our traditions of socializing children and of educating people are very rich and have used a lot of different devices for um, trying to get people to hear, hear the voice from within, what we sometimes call conscience. There are lots of different ways of building a conscience in kids. One is to make them feel proud of what they do when they do right. One is to give them a sense of solidarity. <coughs> One of them is to give them certain respect for certain kinds of principles and so on and so forth. We shouldn't try to think of there being one privileged way of doing that. I'm inclined to think that moral education should imitate you know, the evolutionary devices of our bodies where there are traditions, uh, typically, for things that are really important, you've got redundant systems, you've got backups, and all the rest of it. Uh, we should take advantage of that. Anything we can do that helps people not to behave like the Gestapo, any ways of socializing, 
that will give people lots and lots and lots and lots of different kinds of motivation to act correctly should be welcomed. And of course, there's a, one, this, this is a field for experimentation, it seems to me. And we should draw on all the resources of all the traditions that there have ever been in trying to, trying to figure out good ways of making people respond ethically without cramping them. I mean, you don't want, on the other, to, to make people so conscious of you know, the moral law and, and its weight that they feel absolutely crippled by it. So it's a very, very hard thing. How do you create? How do you, how do you construct a, a healthy conscience? And we should draw on all the resources of science that we have, and all of the, and social science, so the experiments that have been carried out in different cultures, what is known about human psychology. All of that should come into play, and it's a very, it's of course a very important task. But we don't need, I, I think, at the end of the day, the idea of the watcher to do it because there are plenty of people who don't believe in the watcher who are able to do it. Right? And um, to go back to the last question, probably however hard we work at devising strategies for nurturing the healthy conscience, there will probably always be people in any society uh, who deviate, and they will have to be dealt with in other ways. There's nothing, there's nothing more to do. So we'll probably always need systems of punishment. So. All right, I'm going to go over here. Yeah. yeah we seem to be li living in an era where there's a lot of anti-socialization going on in this country. Uh -huh. People that you know, uh, live on their own and sort of play by the rules of discussing and having ideas. Those are good enough. I just want to get them back in with the uh, dialogue and discussion. I honestly don't know. I think uh, the, the question is that, that we seem to be living in an era where, where people are backpedaling away from living in community with others. There's a lot of emphasis on individuals who want to retreat from society. Uh, how do we get them back into uh, discussion with others? Um, look, I think that uh, in the course of the rhetoric in the last election, a lot of quite silly things were said, but there were also some sensible things that were said. And one of the sensible things was that this idea uh, that was touted for a while of, I did it myself, um, is a myth. And that the people who thought that they had done certain things by themselves were heavily dependent on contributions from others. And, and I think one of the things that that has to, has to happen as a, as a social concomitant of living the ethical life is really understanding what you owe to other people, what, what, what other people's behavior and what other people's responses to you have made, pos have, have, have made possible for you. And, um, you know, I mean, that, sh that shouldn't be too hard, I don't think. I mean, it's, you know, Dunn said this beautifully in, uh, in a passage that, uh, that inspired Hemingway. Um, no man is an island. We are all part of the great continent, part of the main, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Um, that's actually in a sermon. And it shows some good things that sometimes happen in sermons. Right? I mean, Dunn saw something very important there. We are all part of one another's lives, and, and getting that sense of being dependent on others, and not being sort of individuals who just um, have, as it were, created ourselves. That, I mean, that's an important task, but I don't think it's an impossible task. All right, now I, I go this way. Yes, yes. I'm just wondering, uh, a byproduct of. Uh, humans having created this high in the sky who's all powerful and who watches everything and uh, who despite the logic that human ethics develop differently and is not only not dependent on 
on that higher authority that has the capability and the advantage of being able to do this on the internet. The byproduct of that, and which I think possibly the creators of the religions were very much aware of, is that the big guy in the sky doesn't only punish deviant behavior, but is a loving and the watching is not made a negative thing necessarily, but a very positive thing. And there are so many, so many people who may not really believe in this punishing God, this vengeful God, but they're being loved, they're being watched because they're being loved. And it does, in reality, give those individuals comfort. Mm -hmm. What is there that that could be replaced with? That's, a, that's really, that really is a wonderful question. And I, I think you're absolutely right to say that, uh, that in, certainly in some religions, the idea of, um, you know, there being merely punishment is extended or possibly replaced, as you said, by this thought that that those who, who, who live well will be rewarded, or possibly that independently of what people do, they will be loved and nurtured and cherished. And what has to replace that, seems to me, the idea of our solidarity with one another, our, our own human loves for one another, and our own human understandings of one another. That has to be what replaces it. And there are certain things it can't replace. It can't replace the thought that there will be some future state at which we get reunited with individuals that, that, um, that we've lost. And that is, of course, a genuine loss. That has to, it seems to me, has to be admitted. Um, I think there are, there are responses that you can make to the to, to when you start thinking about this sort of future union with those who, whom you whom you love and have died, um, but uh, but I think it also has to be admitted, just admitted that that's part of the story that secularism really can't replace. And the challenge then for us is to focus on the lives we lead here and now, and to try to make one another's lives go as well as possible, because these are the only lives we have. I mean, the downside of the, the future-oriented view of the divine love is that it can easily get in the way of our taking responsibility for the problems that people have here and now. And as a secular humanist, I want to focus our attention on those problems directly and clearly. And uh, what to say to the person who has lost a beloved spouse or a beloved child it seems to me very hard. I wasn't particularly talking about the afterlife. Right. I was talking about their feeling protected in this life. Not, not oh no, let's that. see. I mean, but there, I there, I think if, if that's the oh, challenge, if that's the challenge, I think it's easier because I think that you can see genuine, loving human relationships and human responses from other people as a proper and a manageable, a real replacement for that. You can't expect. Um, you know, I mean, if the, if, if the thought is that, that the protection is there, then that's manifestly problematic for very, very large numbers of people. And so the humanist, it seems to me, wants to respond by saying we have to do the very best we who can do something. We have to do the very best we can for those people. We have to supply the protection because that's the only protection there is. Um, but what I'm thinking is that there's a deeper, a deeper demand that is sometimes made, which is, look, when things have gone badly, when the protection has broken down, there's still this further thing that happens beyond in the afterlife when, as it were, it all gets made up. 
And that's, that's it seems to me, is, 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 is the harder part of the challenge. So I was trying to make your, I was trying to make the challenge as hard as possible before I was answering it. Uh, and, but if, if, if what you want is, is a, is a um, response for divine, you know, a replacement for divine love, that's easy in a certain sense. Human love. Because that's real. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned before that we shouldn't be distancing uh, the issue of rights from, from human ethics. Mm -hmm. so, so how would you deal with the issue of animal rights, either as individuals or as species? Ah, that's true. Yeah. And I'm sure you've yeah. had arguments with people. I have, have, I have. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to, I mean, uh, I want to say that um, just as in our decisions that give rise to the rights that human beings have out of our failures to respond to one another. Same is true with respect to non-human animals. And there's nothing sort of intrinsically that these animals have that, that requires us to treat them in a particular way. But I think with respect to a lot of these animals, we've made a tacit contract. Here's how. I mean, what we've done is we've modified their environment tremendously. We've modified them tremendously. Uh, think about domesticated animals. Think about uh, um, the animals that, that are created for purposes of exploring in medicine. So we've removed them from uh, what, is, what is completely unromantic Darwinian world in which they're subject to all sorts of hostile forces. And we place them in a, in a different environment. And that requires us to think about their demands too. It seems to me that those demands are typically and rightly seen as lesser in, in, in requirement than those that come from other human beings. But they are not to be waved away. So I, I, I agree with people like Peter Singer who claim that, that we cannot treat animals with, um, as it were, with extreme cruelty. And uh, let me let me suggest a thought experiment. Uh, imagine a future in which people who know that they are going to die relatively soon allow themselves to be used in studies that um, that involve potentially dangerous new medicines and new drugs. They say, so I, I say, I've only got six months to live. Uh, I know that there could be awful side effects of this drug. Uh, I'm willing to take the risk. I trust my doctors. I trust them to protect me if things go terribly wrong. I'm willing to do it. And let's imagine that I do it first for you know some awful human disease. And imagine that there's somebody even more interested in the well-being of animals who says, we've used animals for these purposes for many years, but there's this awful animal disease and there's this, uh, uh, and there's this um, uh, potential drug and, uh, and we, haven't, we haven't actually thought of, of, of using it on chimps yet, but I'm prepared actually to serve as a, as a guinea pig. And so, as it were, the relationship has been reversed. What you've got is a human model for a non-human animal disease. And, uh, uh, and somebody who is willing to do that. If that stage ever came, then I think we would have entered fully into a kind of contract with the non-human animal world. And would be actually showing very clearly that we, that we were responding to the non-human animals whom we've used for our own purposes. Um, well, okay. why, do, why do you think the animal rights people are not in, concerned with the extinction of species? Um, look, I'm not, I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually myself not terribly concerned with the extinction of species per se. Species go extinct all the time. But there are particular kinds of species that we really worry about going extinct. We might worry about their going extinct because we really care about them or that they're really important to us. 
We might care about them because we think it's an important part of human well-being to have ecosystems in which those species exist. Uh, but I think that these are these are, uh, are things to be worked out collectively. And in some such cases, collectively with representatives of, of, um, of you know, the animal groups, people who actually know about these animals. Loss of biodiversity is a, is a Sorry? gene pools to preserve to fight diseases. But yeah. never before the disease, we collect them, collect them because they're dead. Mm -hmm. They'll be used against some diseases. It's, yeah. it's a very huge issue. Yeah. Look, I mean, this is these issues are very, very hard. I have thought about them. I'm not sure that I've that I've thought them through as well as I'd like. But it seems to me that the 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 underlying um, logic of the position I would take to be exactly the same. This is something to be worked out collectively. And in these cases, there's got to be some sort of uh, represent. Just as we represent the interests of uh, future people. There's got to be some sort of representation of the non-human. Non Professor Kitcher, we have to be out of here in okay. a few minutes. All so right. one last question. Yes, this I gentleman has been line. very patient. Bill, okay. it's a quickie. Okay, I have a quick one. Uh, as far as no man being in Ireland, uh -huh. okay, this is sort of along the lines of um, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. No? I am, I am no utilitarian. Everybody's voice has to be heard. We have to find, I mean, what our ancestors did in inventing ethics was to try to find a solution that everybody could accept. And that's not, that doesn't mean just simply counting. There's, there's something, I mean, this approach to ethics is sort of, in a sense, it's deeply democratic in that everybody's voice counts. But it's not the sort of uh, democracy that says what you do is you simply add up the votes as you did earlier with the, 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 um, the, 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 the great statuette. Um, you actually try to find a solution everybody can live with. That's, that's the challenge. And that's what, that's what human beings have done on various scales again and again and again. You cannot, you cannot have a, a, a solution that leads, leaves anybody out, unless the person left out is one of those who's not playing by the, by the hitherto agreed on rules. One of, the, one, of the, one of the sociopaths. Last question, yes or no? <laughs> Will you accept an honorary membership in the secular society? Yes. <laughs> <laughs>